trains of thought here now with it concerning this prophecy and one is that Nahum's words here echo the words of Isaiah in Isaiah 52 and verse 7 I'll get Jared to read that for us Isaiah 52 and verse 7 how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who proclaims peace, who brings glad, who brings glad tidings of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Okay, Isaiah there is speaking of who? What's that prophecy of? Uh, that was redemption of Jerusalem. Yeah. I guess right. Oh. It's a messianic prophecy in there. Yeah. Okay, it well, is. Uh, yeah. Sort of. Uh, it's quoted in Romans chapter 10. Right. Uh, well, let me check that then. I had that it spoke of the future Messiah. Yeah. Well, I agree. Of it, of Jerusalem, I guess, um, we could say. But even though he echoes those words in that, is that future event intended in Nahum's prophecy? That's the question I ask myself. Um, and I believe, and it's open for discussion, but I believe that Judah is being told here and comforted about a soon-to-take place event. Um, even though Nineveh is still at her full power, the time is coming now for devastation to take place. And the news of her overthrow would be heralded and received as good news. Um, and because of this favor and blessing from God, let me get back to, to Nahum 1 so I can just uh, point out the wording as to my way of thinking. Um, Nahum 1 and 15 was where I was at. Um, okay, when it says, Behold on the mountains the feet of him who brings good tidings, who proclaim peace. Okay, I, I believe that is just the thought of, of someone, the, the idea that Nineveh has been destroyed now. 
and this is good news to uh, to Judah. And it's the end part that kind of leaned me towards that way of thinking was because um, Nahum's telling them now when that has taken place, you remember your God. Okay? And again, pay the humble respect to Jehovah by keeping his feasts once again. That's my way of thinking. And if, if that was aimed only at Christ, well, we've heard the good news, the good tidings that Christ has brought salvation to us, but we don't have to perform any vows, any appointed feasts. Um, so, but even though Nahum's echoing Isaiah's prophecy, um, to me, we are reminded of the lasting salvation and peace offered to us uh, through Jesus Christ, and Jeremy said, Romans 10 and 15. Um, so we are um, reminded it, of it, but sometimes, if we had earlier said, um, not every prophet is, is prophesying um, exactly of, of Jesus Christ. Um, and, and I just think, um, of course, we're reminded of him through this verse, but I, I think this verse was aimed more at Judah because Judah's been under the power of Assyria, um, you know, and God is telling them now, I'm going to rid you of that enemy. And then when that happens, Nahum says, you remember me. It's just like the same words can mean different things in different contexts. When you, when especially when you read in the book of Revelation, a lot of the figures and symbols. Well, in the Old Testament, they might have had physical um, connotations to them. Uh, it's, when we, it's when we don't recognize the context. And, and I, I would agree, uh, like I said, the wicked one shall no longer pass through you, he is utterly cut off. That has a specific context to Nahum uh, and to Judah at that time. Right. Whereas, e even though the words, even though the words have, have been taken in the New Testament to apply to Christ or the spreading of the gospel, <coughs> in this time, Nahum was spreading the good news to Judah about deliverance at that time right. from Nineveh. And just because Paul takes it, uh, he probably is quoting Isaiah more than he is Nahum, but. Just because Paul takes that as a spiritual thing doesn't mean that there wasn't a physical aspect to it um, right. in the Old Testament. And so you can use the same phrases to mean different things in different contexts. Right, right. And the idea of salvation is in both um, for us under Christ and uh, for Judah at that time. So then we move on. Um, there we go, to the content now of Nahum, and we begin with the majesty of God, and we're asked in question six, why does Nahum spend the first portion of the book praising God for his majesty and power? Remember, that's how Nahum began uh, his book, by praising God, and We'd, I'd like us to look then at what Nahum says of God, and um, Tammy, I'll get you just to read verses one and two. We'll just uh, we'll just go verse by verse so we don't lose uh, our thoughts. So verse one and two, please. The burden against Nineveh, the book of the vision of Nahum the Elkoshite. God is jealous and the Lord avenges. The Lord avenges and is furious. The Lord will take vengeance on his adversaries, and he reserves wrath for his enemies. Okay. Now, we've already looked at uh, the phrase that God is a jealous God, haven't we? Remember, we went through all that. And what did we say about his jealousy? Um, does he have a right to be jealous? Usually, when we're jealous, it's out of envy, right? Um, but remember, we tried to define the difference. Does does God have a right to be jealous? Yeah. yeah right. 
Right. Um, those were his people. So he had a right to be jealous for them and also righteous jealousy because they weren't obeying him. Um, and uh, also he is a forgiving God. We looked at all that to those who trust in him. When we trust in God and seek his forgiveness, then he is forgiving. And then he desires us to be with him. But Nahum now, uh, verse 3, uh, Kala, verse 3. <clears throat> the Lord is slow to anger and great in power, and the Lord will by no means leave the guilty unpunished. In whirlwinds and storm is his ways, and clouds are the dust beneath his feet. Okay. <clears throat> <laughs> so what do we see here uh, first of God? What's it say of him? Slow to anger and great in power. Right, right. Uh, his greatness then, uh, he's slow to, to be angry, which is wonderful, um, which is an attribute that we need to always work towards. And he's great in power. And then Nahum emphasizes all that um, emphasizes his great power through the thought of the control over storms and whirlwinds. Um, he speaks of his lofty position above the clouds. And whirlwinds and storms are often used to describe God's coming judgment. If you turn back to uh, I'll, I'll read it so it doesn't, uh, if you don't want to turn there. If you turn back to Psalms 83, and we just have an example of this. Psalms 83 and verse uh, 15. So pursue them with your tempest. Here's the psalmist speaking of, of God. Pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. And then also in Isaiah, it uh, just gives us an idea. Sometimes we read these verses and um, without thinking sometime deeply, we wonder what on earth are we talking about here? But we use analogies um, like this all the time. Well, maybe not all the time, but we do in our, our language. But Isaiah said, you will be punished by the Lord of hosts with thunder and earthquake and great noise with storm and tempest and the flame of devouring fire um, so what does this bring to mind why would Nahum be using this type of poetry like this is the thought of storms and, and earthquakes does that not bring fear to you you think? Yeah, that's and that's why Nahum's using that, just reminding um, Judah of that. And now then we, there's no other thoughts, we'll go on to, to verse 4. Um, and Lista, do you want to read verse 4, please? Of Nahum chapter 1. He reveals the deceit and hence he tries, and tries up all the rivers. Okay. Now here, um, what is God? What is it telling us that God is able to do? What's it telling us He's able to do? He controls nature. But, right. And exactly. He rebukes the sea and makes it dry. He's drying up the rivers. And if you think, where has he shown this type of power before? Does something come to your mind? When the Egyptians was coming out of Egypt and he caused the, the, the land to part, the water to separate and all this. Even all the, all the um, plagues that he sent. 
He is in control of nature. He can do, use it to his advantage. He is God. He can do whatever he wants. Exactly. <coughs> exactly. That's, that was one um, area I taught it was the Red Sea when God parted the waters and, and Israel crossed over on dry land. Um, you know, uh, that's amazing dust when we read it. Imagine them standing at the edge of the sea and then the seas parting. And also uh, in Joshua 3, uh, remember the Jordan River. God caused that um, to separate the, the waters from the, the dry land. Um, and so with those reminders, we're just reminded, he's beginning to have Judah consider here who they are dealing with. Um, and as Tammy said, God can control nature, do as he pleases with us. Um, that's not to say when we have violent storms, God has caused them, because I don't know that, and you don't know that. Um, God has set nature in course, so as we're always have rain for stuff to grow, we have winter, um, he set those seasons in order. Um, the violence of them sometimes, uh, I certainly wouldn't say that, well, God's doing that, uh, because uh, of sin. We don't know that. But on the other hand, it just reminds us that this is his creation. Um, his, his creation is a powerful thing. And then uh, finally, uh, verse 5. Or not finally, but read verse 5. Uh, Henry, please. Nahum 1, verse 5. The mountains quake for him, the hills melt, and the earth helps uh, who he was at his cradles. He has a word, and I'll be prepared in it. Okay, so again, what's, uh, what is the thought here? What's, what's Nahum hoping um, Judah might understand? How's he using the earth here? Do you see the thought of of the of the earth trembling, of of uh, the mountains quaking, of of, uh, of earth cave quakes, um, that type of idea that the earth um, will tremble in in God's presence. Um, they're all just analogies to have us understand his power, who, who we are dealing with here. And then by ascribing such glory uh, to God, Nahum demonstrates that it's well within his power to judge the wicked, okay? And that they would not be able to stand in the face of his wrath. If he can do this, with nature, who are, in other words, who are these people? Who are these Assyrians? So we look at verse 6, and we read that. Uh, Cherry, do you want to read verse 6, please? Who can stand Okay, so do you see what Nahum's trying to get us to see here when he says, who can stand before his indignation? In other words, if God has this power over uh, the earth, over <coughs> the things that he's created, um, who are we? Who can stand before God and... and make any judgment or any claim, who can argue with them, who can endure. Uh, remember, Assyria was always taking everything by force and by war. Uh, 
what good will that be using that against God? You know, that's the, the idea that, uh, that I see. Um, and if, uh, how do they stand in the face of God's wrath? And then verses, uh, anyone else has any thoughts? Just put your hand up. We'll just read then. Uh, now we'll read to, we'll add on to verse 8. We'll read to uh, verse 11. Um, what will I see here? Verse 9 to 11 we'll read. Um, and you can read ten, or verse 9 and then Tim and, and uh, Sandy can take 10 and 11. Why do you plot against the Lord? You will make her in. No adversary will let her twice. For where tangled like from, and where drunk like drunken, they shall be devoted like <coughs> not holy joy. Come here, come to Okay, well verse 9 now, um, Nahum is again, uh, with the praise that Nahum has offered here, um, it's plain to see, even verse 9 says, who, who do you conspire, or what do you conspire against the Lord? He will make another end of it, affliction will not rise up a second time. Um, verse 10 and 11 I should have saved. We'll look at them uh, a little later on in, a, in another question, because that's just uh, that analogy is of the shape that Assyria it, it will be in. Um, but we just see then that everything <coughs> Nahum is offered here um, is just that we see that God is powerful that he is a majestic God and that he would have no problem in bringing down even a most powerful city such as Nineveh uh, in verse 7 and 8 uh, of that uh, reading he says uh, the Lord is good a stronghold in the day of trouble and he knows those who trust in him um, and he'll make another end of, of its place, speaking of Nineveh, and darkness will uh, pursue his enemies. So we just see then what Nahum is trying to have Judah understand, that God is all-powerful, and he's more powerful than Nineveh, and its armies and its kings. So we'll move on then. Um, to the poetic description of Nineveh's fall. And we, how does Nahum describe the battle in which Nineveh would fall? And Dave asks us, how would the outcome indicate that it would be decided by God? Um, first of all, turn to chapter 2, because that's where... Uh, will be looking. Um, Assyria, something interesting, Assyria always represented herself in her sculptures, uh, in her carvings, in her idols, as a, a proud lion. Um, but that majestic animal would only endure now, okay, from Nahum's prophecy, as the national symbol in her archaeological remains. It was to be no more. The lion was going to be routed from its high places now for all the wickedness and evil it had perpetrated before the Lord of the universe. And Nahum begins to paint a picture now of battle um, here. Uh, and he begins with the army approaching and excitement could be high in Nineveh as she prepares now um, for battle. She's never been taken in battle. Assyria has controlled 
of the Bible lands at that time for many centuries. And now um, she's going to be wiped out by God. And so we'll just um, we'll read verses 1 to 5. Um, Jeremy, if you'd like, uh, we'll read, read a verse each then. And uh, begin with verse 1 of chapter 2. Now he who scatters has come up before your face. Man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power mightily. For the Lord will restore the excellence of Jacob like the excellence of Israel. For the emptiers have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. The shields of his mighty men are colored red. The warriors are dressed in scarlet. The chariots are enveloped in flesh and steel. When he is prepared to march, and the cypress spreads a, ban a branch brandish. <coughs> they cannot land in the streets. They just leave one another in the blood box. They sing like torches. They run like lightning. Gates of the rivers shall be opened, and the palace shall be dissolved. Okay, that was verse 5. Six. Okay. We see here, first of all, in, in uh, verse 1, as Nahum describes this battle, um, it's almost like mockery here um, he who scatters has come before your face um, now a lot of the commentators wonder whether it is speaking of God or the Babylonians and the Medes I kind of lean a little more towards God because uh, uh, he scatters anything that uh, he can, chooses to scatter and it's almost like a mockery here to, uh, to Assyria because they've never had any fear of any other nation. They've always been in control. And here they're, be here they're being told, man the fort, watch the road, strengthen your flanks, fortify your power uh, mightily. Um, they may have thought of this as, as if. Why are we being told this? Uh, we don't have a problem in battle. Um, but then we see in, in verse 2, um, they're being told the Lord is going to again restore the excellence of Jacob, the excellence of, of Israel. Um, for the emptiers, and I believe that's speaking of Assyria, uh, have emptied them out and ruined their vine branches. Um, there was a couple thoughts maybe on the excellence of, of Jacob. Remember, God has spoke of the temple uh, of being his excellence. And uh, in a few passages in Isaiah where Israel's being told that God was going to uh, defame them, they were his excellence, but because of their sin, of Israel's sin, God was going to turn his back on that thought. Um, you know, the world viewed Israel as, uh, as all powerful at one time. Um, you know, Samaria stood out, Jerusalem stood out, um, and the idea of uh, Assyria emptying that out, defaming that, um, and the idea of ruined their vine branches, Israel was... Uh, in many passages spoken of, of God's wine and, and his vineyard. Um, so that is kind of what Nahum is, is uh, aiming at there. And then in verse 3, um, here I believe this is speaking of the armies. Uh, the Babylonians, I think it was, uh, they were dressed in red. Their battle uniforms were red. Um, and the Medes, Apparently their, their hats and scarves were of scarlet um, and uh, just depicting the scene of, of the army that was going to invade um, 
invade Nineveh. And the chariots come with flaming torches, and the spears are brandished. Uh, brandished. It's all just the scene of, of war. This is what Nineveh is going to be up against. And verse 4 is the same, the, the thoughts of chariots uh, rage in the street. Um, just the whole picture of uh, this is a battle, this is a war that you have never seen before. Um, and that is like why he was saying in verse 1, um, kind of mocking them, um, you be ready uh, because the Lord has, is coming upon you now. And then verse 6, we uh, discussed the, the thoughts of that, um, the idea that secular history, whether God caused the rivers um, and the, the, rain to, uh, the rain to overflow the rivers, um, we don't know, but history kind of went along with uh, that idea. And then verse 7, we'll read... Uh, where were we? Verse 7. Um, Henry or? James right now. Oh, James. So, Henry. Verse 7. It's decreed. She shall be led away captive. She shall be brought up. And from mid servants shall lead her as with the voice of the cows and beating their breasts. And verse, we'll read verse 8 also, Annie, yeah, please. Nineveh is like a bull who the water runs in hell hath, as no land turns back. Okay, so in verse 7, just the thought of the inhabitants here of Nineveh are going to be taken captive. Um, and this. Um, and the idea of she shall be brought up, her maidservant shall lead her, as with the voice of doves, uh, beating their breasts. Beating their breasts is kind of the, the scene of sorrow. Um, and she shall be brought up. And with the thought of maidservants, I could be speaking of the queen. Um, and the whole picture here is that this is just unbelievable to the Ninevites way of thinking and to the armies, to the kings. Um, you know, to them this would be a joke because this nation has never endured anything like that. There wasn't a nation around strong enough to, uh, to, uh, to destroy her. Um, and so we see, um, they haven't seen yet, but we see this is because of God's power. There was nothing that could stand uh, in front of him. And uh, verse uh, 8 and 9, uh, Tim and Sandy, verse 8 and 9. Just read 8. Oh. 9 and 10. Oh, did we just read verse 8? And he did. Oh, did. oh, I'm sorry. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, that's right. Yeah, verse 8, just the idea there. Um, that Nineveh of old was like a pool of water. Um, maybe the pool of water is speaking of kind of like an oasis. Um, it was a beautiful city, uh, not only in architecture, but also in protection. So the idea of an oasis. Um, but now they're going to flee from that. The Ninevites are going to are flee. Um, and they'll you know, the army might call halt, halt, um, but nobody's turning back. Everybody is fleeing. Um, just that scene of, of devastation. And then, uh, so it was 9 and 10 we haven't read? Yeah. Okay, uh, Tim and Sandy. <coughs> Sorry. This boy of silver, this boy of gold, there is no land of treasure, or earth of any desirable price. Okay, and here then, 
Remember uh, in verse 9, take spoil of silver. Nineveh was filled um, with riches and, and material uh, wealth that she had taken from other nations. Um, there were storehouses full of it. And now they're being told that the army is going to take this. Um, there's going to be no end of treasure for the army. Just the idea of, uh, of huge amounts of wealth. Um, and then verse 10, just explaining to I'm saying she'll be desolate. She'll be, she'll be empty. Um, people's hearts will melt, will melt. Their knees will shake um, just through the utter devastation that they're going to see. And God, um, I'll try and finish uh, this part. God, who said that he would personally bring judgment onto Nineveh, speaks directly to that city. If you look back in, in chapter 1, I'll, I'll just end with these few verses. And remember, the thought was just, you know, maybe we can see this and understand it through considering our nations that we live in. The size of some of the nations in the world today, and everybody boasts of their power, their, their military strength. We see it all the time. You know, we see a lot of Korea on the news, and they're just miles of marching army and tanks and missiles. Um, and all of these nations individually think they're indestructible. You know, they brag and boast to other nations. You know, we dare you um, type idea. And Nineveh had the same frame of mind. And yet God is having them see, in verse 14, we read Nahum 1, The Lord has given a, ma a command concerning you. Your name shall be perpetrated no longer. It will be spoken of no longer whether that's the king's name or Nineveh. Uh, and out of the house of your gods, I will cut off the carved image and the molded image. I will dig your grave, God says to them, for you are vile. And then over in chapter 2, and uh, in verse 13, chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, Behold, I am against you, says the Lord of hosts. I will burn your chariots in smoke, and the sword shall devour your young lions. I will cut off your prey from the earth, and the voice of your messengers shall be heard no more. By destroying Nineveh, God's going to inflict them with a wound that would never heal. He tells them that. That will be our last verse, and I'll, I'll sneak that in. Um, chapter 3 and verse 19. Um, your injury has no healing. Your wound is severe. All who hear news of you will clap their hands over you. For upon whom has not your wickedness passed continually? God is going to wipe them out completely and they would never heal. And it was interesting, a secular note that I read that it, it wasn't until the early 1900s that that city was discovered. Uh, they say uh, Greece marched over it in battle, not even knowing it was there. That's how considerable the wipeout was that, that God placed upon them. That city was never discovered. Um, he just leveled it completely. I'm not ashamed to...